The Sunset Strip Diaries by Amy Asbury, read by the author. Copyright 2011 by Amy Asbury, published by S. Stepp and Fitzgerald Books. This is the story of my teenage years as I remember them. Some names and minor characteristics have been purposely changed. Chapter 1. This can't be happening. My childhood ended the day I woke up with my underwear missing. I was 11 years old, almost 12. I got up to go to the bathroom in the morning, and as I started walking, I realized I wasn't wearing my underwear, and my girl parts felt all smushy and puffy. Something felt off. I knew I wore underwear to bed. I never slept without underwear. I looked down and realized that not only was I not wearing underwear, not only did I feel all weird down there, but I was wearing something else. I was wearing some sweats that were way too small, and they were also way too hot for summertime. I had no memory of changing myself into these sweats or of someone else changing me into them. I didn't know what happened, and I didn't tell anyone. I turned 12 in September 1985, and I went on with my life, tried to ignore the incident as I entered the seventh grade that fall. I was nervous because I knew I wouldn't know anyone at the new school I was going to attend. My grade school friends were all going to the local public junior high schools, and I was enrolled at a private school called Middleton because my mother had heard horror stories about the other schools. I decided to wear my floral cotton pants, tapered, of course, and rolled at the ankle, a white tank top with a pink fishnet shirt thing over it for the all-important first day of school. I wore pink karate shoes with white fishnet bobby socks, Oof. and my hair was a little bit below my ears. I thought I looked like Madonna, but I'm pretty sure I looked like a hot sack of crazy. Now, Middleton Christian School was very different from any school I had ever attended. It was still in Los Angeles' San Fernando Valley, as my grade school had been, but it was a private school, something to which I was not accustomed. It looked like an office building inside. I was expecting to see some cubicles and some insurance salesmen with files in their hands. The whole place was air-conditioned, what? Properly insulated and professionally painted. That really threw me off. It didn't have that familiar school smell of dusty books, musty classrooms that smelled like mildew, or cheap cafeteria food, all which would have comforted me in some way. Instead, I smelled of new sour paint and that chemical smell of newly cleaned carpet. There was even fluorescent lighting overhead, no natural sunlight against faded mint green walls. The place was beige. There was a fish-eyed receptionist in the lobby with some potted palm plants next to her desk, and for visitors, a few couches that were nicer than the ones in my parents' living room. There was an elevator that was supposed to be for wheelchairs, but it ended up taking lazy teachers to the second floor. As I passed them, waiting for the doors to open, drinking their coffee and avoiding eye contact, I often noted that I made it to the second floor via the stairs before the elevator doors even opened for them. There were bright yellow bathrooms that had a little foyer separating the sinks from the stalls. The stalls had working locks, and there was no graffiti to read while I was peeing. Two things that were strange. There was green grass outside and climbing trees, and even a little marquee that stated it was the new fall semester. There was a shrew of a woman named Mrs. Baxman, who was the bell. By that, I mean she used a big old bullhorn to call everyone back in from recess and lunch. She was fucking loud. She always looked disastrous in a denim shirt, jeans, beat-up tennis shoes, and some do-it-yourself orange peroxided hair. The kids looked nicer than she did, but no one ever made fun of her or crossed her. There is an instinct in kids that tells them who they can pick on and who would beat them upside the head with a shoe, and she fell into the latter category. I don't remember much of what happened on my first day of school, with the exception of that entirely ridiculous outfit for which I should have been issued 25 fashion police citations. I just remember that most of the kids knew each other from the previous year. I was one of the outsiders, along with a big-mouthed girl named Jennifer Bettina, who took to me and stuck by me. I thought she cramped my style worse than it already was, and I tried to get away from her. She finally dropped me before I could even smile with relief. I was quickly irritated. 
She started hanging out with one of the popular girls, and the whole class started calling her Bitsy. I was shocked that they accepted her. I was like, wait a second, she's a total dork. But her confidence made her surpass me in the social scene, despite her buck teeth and sun-end hair. I couldn't bring myself to talk to anyone and had my head down all of the time, so I was ignored. I knew I was no beauty, but I was, I was convinced I was better than that hoe. Bitsy was always talking about guys and sex and things that embarrassed me. I was always terrified that she would ask me if I, I had ever kissed a boy or had a boyfriend. I didn't want to be put on the spot. And that type of girl was always the first one to call me out. I ended up hanging out with another shy girl by default. She had no one else to hang out with, and she did not even like me. There were just no other choices. We barely spoke to each other. Her name was Marcia Alvarado, and she was very small and Latin, with big bangs and a mustache that would have made Tom Selleck jealous. The majority of the girls at Middleton were white, pretty, and rich. They were mostly German and Scandinavian blondes, with the exception of Kelly Fiorella, who was brunette, Italian, and channeling Annette Funicello. They grouped up while walking to the P.E. field to play softball, singing the Pet Shop Boys' West End Girls. I would trail behind them, wondering how I could learn the words, too. They must have had the cassette tape or the record and could really listen to the songs. I didn't have any. I would wait until a song came on the radio or on MTV, and I would record it with my tape recorder, hoping to get it from the beginning, without the DJ talking over it. The girls also grouped up and sang Wham! and Madonna songs. There was nothing worse than crunching on those little rocks behind them all the way to the field, looking at their cool, rolled-up sweats and perfectly worn t-shirts. I always had dorky socks and stiff, new-looking, cheap sweats. The band AHA was the biggest deal that school year. It was all about their song, Take On Me, and the accompanying music video, which was like the craziest thing any of us had ever seen in the way of special effects. Robert Palmer's Addicted to Love was the other big video, along with Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer. The Middleton girls were all into new wave or mainstream pop. There was no love of rap like there was at my grade school, Tadley, where the black kids break danced to Rum DMC and sang LL Cool J's Rock the Bells. There were no rocker kids, no one who wore Aussie or Def Leppard concert t-shirts or brought Motley Crue records to school or sang Van Halen and Quiet Riot songs. I miss the mixture of different cultures and ethnicities of kids. Middleton had a strict dress code. You could not wear t-shirts or any of the stuff people wore at Tadley. I was wondering what the hell kind of choices that left for me. I remember looking around at the clothes the girls wore. They looked really fancy. It took money to acquire the things they had. They all had elaborately styled hair and polished accessories. Well if huge geometric shapes could be considered polished. I never saw so many fashionable and brand names of clothing at once. They wore the pants that were rolled at the ankle, the little boot type shoes, big colorful shirts, hanging belts and big earrings, and their hair was uh, worn usually short, just past the ears. They wore swatch watches, sometimes two or three at a time, and even their sweatshirts, which had to be worn with a collar, were expensive, ton sur ton, guess, Esprit, Benetton. My stuff normally came from Marshalls, so I was very uncomfortable. I thought it was why I didn't fit in with the other kids. I didn't know how I wanted to look. I still kind of wanted to hide my body. A boy in class named Chris Chivas made a comment about me having big boobs. Ugh, I felt very uncomfortable. I took to wearing my dad's big shapeless sweaters and shirts. I felt very disgusted with my body, very ashamed of it. We had to visit what we called an old folks home to do some charity work that year. We were to bring either A, a hairbrush slash comb set, B, slippers, or C, some other shit that I don't remember. My mom wrapped a pair of slippers and off I went. Each of us was to find a random elderly person and give them our gift. I felt shy and nervous looking around the room at the elderly men and women, many with canes, walkers, or wheelchairs. I decided... Someone in a wheelchair was the worst off. So I approached the woman with a pink blanket over her lap and I gave her the slippers. She looked at me as if I were the biggest asshole she had met in her 105 years. She yanked up the blanket to show me she had no legs, let alone feet. Some of the kids around me snickered. I wanted to dissolve into the linoleum. 
I went off to hide behind a group of eighth graders who were in a semicircle singing the theme song to Gilligan's Island, as if it were an award-winning Broadway melody. The elderly people just stared at them, and a few old men yelled and cursed at them, which is what I would have done. I was scared of the older kids in the eighth and ninth grades. They looked like 35-year-olds to me. All of the ninth grade guys had popped collars, feathered hair, and Ray-Ban sunglasses. They had names like Cliff and Blake, names that sounded like the preppy kids who picked on the karate kid or some other 80s underdog. The boys in my grade were not like the ones I had known in the public school system. It was a different dynamic. The Middleton kids were all sheltered and all had very similar tastes. It was clear none of them were bust in from downtown Los Angeles like many of the boys I used to know. It was clear they had never been on a bus, period. I got more into the groove of the place throughout the year and made the best of it, and even had some laughs somewhere in there, I'm sure. There were boys I daydreamed and fantasized about, just like any other 12-year-old. One in particular was an Italian boy named Mark Poletti. He was cute, he was social, he was a class clown. His personality reminded me of Mike Seaver on the TV show Growing Pains. There was a popular song at the time called How Will I Know by Whitney Houston, and I thought of him every time I heard it. I secretly pined after this boy all through the school year, not seeing zits or braces or ridiculous 80s clothes. I imagined us making out for hours. The Middleton teachers seemed strange to me. Switching classes and teachers every hour was no fun. I could never bond with the people sitting next to me because it would be different each hour. There was a very pious woman named Ms. Kavofsky who wore not a stitch of makeup and had perfectly feathered hair. It would have looked fabulous had it still been 1981, but it was the mid-80s and it was all about high, hairsprayed, stiff bangs. Ms. Kavofsky had big thighs and often rocked a camel toe, I don't know why, but I could not help but stare at the private parts of every one of those teachers for some reason. She was very, very serious. She did not joke around. She did not smile. She was all about business, and she was strict. She would have made an excellent nun, now that I think about it. The person who I most checked out was Mr. Sterling, who was the principal, but he taught seventh grade Bible class for shits and giggles. He loved to talk about masturbation and how terrible it was. He always smirked and looked around the room when he talked of having lascivious thoughts. I used to hold my breath and think, can he read my mind? Oh no, he looks like he knows what I've been thinking. Truth be told, he did know what we were all thinking. We were teenagers. I always looked right at his crotch, and I'm telling you, there was no way to avoid it. His package was smashed up in his tight slacks, causing a huge bulge that was eye level to everyone sitting at a desk. And because he was sitting and slouching over that ancient old podium, the tip of his tie was like an arrow pointing to his package. How could I not stare? It was madness. Anyway, Mr. Sterling looked and acted a bit like Richard Gere. He was cocky and confident and cool. There was a Japanese English teacher named Mr. Isumi. He was always dragging his words and acting as if he were the coolest thing to hit the planet. He was king shit on Turd Island. He wanted validation from the boys and tried to flirt with the girls. He was sort of a dick. He never smiled. He drew weird things on the marker boards and tried to crack teenage jokes. He was most known for saying, hey, uh, guys, when we weren't paying attention. I seem to remember him wearing a lot of light blue. His class was when I did most of my daydreaming about Mark Paletti. There was a serious history and science teacher named Mr. Westchester. Whom I always pictured as one of Jesus' disciples dressed in a beige hooded robe because he had that dark curly hair and a beard. He was very on point. He had little tolerance for teenagers. He was always let down by our performance and irritated at our stupidity. It's crazy to think he was only 26 at the time, but he was, as per my diary. Mr. Westchester hated it if you closed your book before the bell rang and he made anyone who did so stay one minute after class. And I hated that because I needed that minute to put on more makeup over the three pounds of makeup already on my face. My makeup application was frightful. First of all, I wore tinted Clarisel pimple cream as foundation. Yes, you read correctly. It was meant to cover one or two zits, but I rubbed it all over my face and I didn't even have zits at the time. It was so thick. 
It crusted right over my eyebrows, which were big and sparse at the same time. I then used navy blue eyeliner on the inner rims of my eyes, which always seemed to then smear down under my eyes. I applied some chalky lavender eyeshadow to top things off, and then to really get the party started, I doused myself in this cheap drugstore body spray that was a knockoff of some other reputable brand. I thought, this is perfume and I am a girl. I had better drown myself in it. Needless to say, I'm sure I smelled like an old lady. Not only did my scent, my social skills, my clothes, my makeup application suck, but my hair sucked. I was determined to use mousse as Tiffany Nixon had in the sixth grade. I couldn't figure out how to use the stuff, so I just put a big puffy glob of it in my hair and let it dry. I had crusty, oily, wavy bangs and an all around assholey hairstyle. I had to invent that word just for my hair. Okay. So I was down because of the whole prepubescent hormones thing and the not fitting in thing. That was probably normal, made me moody. But some other things started to seep into the family, my family, and it poisoned me a little further. I will tell the story of how it looked and felt to me because I only know it from that angle. My mother had been very involved in my life when I was a young child. And not only had she always worked at the schools I attended, but she always told me how smart I was and she was always very supportive of me. I hadn't needed to be pretty or athletic. I was quote unquote smart. I was really fulfilled with that identity, whether or not it was even true. My mother always seemed so impressed with me and proud of me. But in that seventh grade year, not only did she no longer work at the school I attended, but she stopped telling me how great I was. I was surely moody and bitchy, so that couldn't have helped. And maybe she had other things on her mind and didn't have the inclination to continue with her encouragement. Understandable in hindsight, but it was hurtful to a 12 year old with already low self esteem. But then it got worse. She stopped communicating with me almost altogether. I was really confused. It didn't make sense that someone who had been so loving toward me in the past would suddenly just stop liking me, but it appeared to be true. I thought something was really, really wrong with me and I didn't know what I did. The few times I did catch her eyes, they were dead and flat and black. I didn't talk about it and tried not to think about it. I even thought, good, who wants their mom all over them in junior high? I went on and tried to live my life as a regular person. She still had talks with me about puberty from time to time, tried to take me somewhere nice every once in a while. She wasn't beating me with a hanger, but something was wrong. Our family took our last trip with our family friends, the Ashfords, that winter. We rented a cabin at Pine Mountain, and one of the things I remember most was that I had an uneasy feeling during the entire trip. Something happened to me just before that trip or during that trip, and it didn't involve the Ash Ashfords. It was within my family. I asked my younger sister, Becky, about it. She said, yeah, that was the year I started staying away from home a lot. I don't know what it was, but I do remember that weird feeling at Pine Mountain. I remember I was really embarrassed for some reason and the dog they brought wouldn't stop sniffing my crotch. I wet my pants and I never wet my pants. I felt really uncomfortable during that trip. I kept walking out in the leaves by myself and mom came looking for me for a few times. Sorry guys for all my um, audible mistakes. I'm doing this in one take. I am no pro. I'm just reading. Forgive me for all my mistakes. Moving on. And this is back to me talking here. As much as my mother hurt me with her dead eyes and cut off communication, my bad feelings started to gravitate toward my father. I started to feel uncomfortable when he kissed me. It wasn't the little cute dry pecks he gave me as a child. It was different. When he kissed me, I felt his mustache and a bunch of blubber in my lips and mouth. It was slobbery. I had to tighten my mouth and shut my eyes very hard, and I would wipe off my mouth afterward, making sure he saw me do it. I felt very disgusted and angry. It was very confusing, and it built up like a volcano inside me. One day, he held his eyes on mine from across the living room and fumbled with his crotch. I felt furious. I winced and I twisted up my face in disgust. I couldn't speak, though. I couldn't talk. That's a weird thing. My mouth could never say stop. My arms couldn't push. My legs couldn't run. He was my dad. I kept thinking, no, I must be taking this wrong. This can't really be occurring because this is too bizarre. 
He started to wear these Capizio dance shoes, and I was always tapping his feet and shifting around anxiously. I thought he was going to break out into tap dance like Gregory Hines or something. His moods became erratic. He started acting extremely haughty, arrogant, full of himself. He seemed to think he was very wise, and he started quoting Bible verses that my sister and I didn't understand, as if the verse were some sort of code that we'd best figure out soon. We would be like, huh? His logic was usually lost on us. Sometimes he had a lot of anger and he couldn't express it, but his eyes showed it. He tilted his head very far back and he got a very serious look on his face and he had his eyebrows up. His words wouldn't come to him at these moments, but something was streaming through him that was thick and electric and angry. It looked to me as if he wanted to say something to really, really hurt me during these times. In other days, it seemed he had an overwhelming urge to physically hurt me, but I did not understand. He had always loved me so much, too. It was always so much fun and sweet. I couldn't understand what had changed between us. My dad was angry one time, and he took my lavender chair in my room and smashed it in a million pieces over my desk. It was my special desk where I wrote my plays and my commercials. I shrank back and covered my face, and it curled inside myself. He felt terrible afterwards, and he kept bringing it up and wanting forgiveness. He said he would make it up to me, and I winced. I just wished he would just stay away from me. On another day, he said he was taking me somewhere special, and it was a surprise. I felt totally uncomfortable at the thought of being alone with him, but there was really nothing I could do. My mother would not make eye contact with me, and I couldn't even identify my thoughts if she had. I couldn't let myself have the thought that kept tapping at my mind. No, that is too weird. I felt trapped and miserable. I could barely remember the night. I was so full of disgust and anger and fear, I just couldn't speak. I don't think I said two words. We were driving in the dark for a really long time before I finally realized we were arriving at Disneyland, which was my very favorite place. I just didn't want to be there with him. I was thinking, why the heck are we arriving here in the dark? It's nighttime. This place is about to close down. I thought it odd because we wouldn't be able to go on many rides at such a late time. He took me to dinner at my favorite spot in New Orleans Square and got me my favorite dish at that time, which was a French dip. After dinner, he wanted just to walk around holding my hand. I just felt very uncomfortable. Everything was so serious and quiet. I just felt like his date. I wanted to just run. I wanted someone to save me, but there was no one to protect me. And I can remember none of what we talked about, only that I was just squirming inside and I could not wait to be home. I looked at my makeup in the mirror on the way home, and my eyeliner had once again slid down my face, making two black eyes. I was mad that he let me walk around like that the whole night. I said, Dad, look at my makeup. It's halfway down my face. He said, well, I don't care. I love you no matter what. And part of me thought, what if he's really just trying to bond with me? But my gut instinct told me I was in danger. Not too long after that, my dad pulled me aside at my grandmother's house. He knelt down to me and said that he loved me more than he loved my sister. Wait a second. I felt disturbed and confused. Why couldn't he just be normal? What was that? Okay, so there I was. I was 12. Something went down about six months prior that required someone removing my underwear and changing my clothes. And now my parents were acting really, really weird. And if I were to acknowledge what was going on, I just wouldn't survive. What was I going to do? Run away? Go out and get a job at 12? I just had to go on. I depended on my father for a roof over my head, for food, for clothing. My mother was completely shut off from me, and even if she weren't, I doubt I would have confided in her because my trust level was at an all-time low. The boundaries in my life were just being smeared all over the place like paint on a canvas. My perception of reality was just whirling into a hurricane, just piercing the blue sky, ripping it open to show a dark place. It just made me feel crazy. It was as if suddenly everything that meant security and protection had just crumbled. I started to fall into a depression. I just didn't feel safe in my house. In order to avoid running into my father, I decided that staying in my room was the safest thing to do. Of course, that room was no safer than the rest of the house, but I didn't have many options. I completely took myself out of reality when I was in my room. I read books at a feverish pace, escaping into stories. 
I pretended I was the characters I read about and I made up games by myself. And sometimes I was a scullery maid on creaky floorboards talking to mice. And other times I was a child living in a manor on the English countryside. I wanted to be anywhere but in my own life. I regressed to playing like a child again. I set up my stuffed animals as a little family and I talked to them, my little tea parties with them. I know that sounds all, oh, poor me, but that's what I did. I was talking to my dolls like they could hear me. I mean, that kind of stuff is normal for a five-year-old, but not for somebody in junior high school. I hung with my sister if she were home, and I spent time with my childhood friend Karen. But I did not make any friends at school because I rarely spoke. I no longer went outside, and I wouldn't join my family when they went out to dinner. I did have my days where I was okay, and most days I was a normal preteen thinking about boys and movie stars. But inside, I just felt off and I didn't want anybody looking at me. I felt like everyone could see inside me and I just didn't want anyone to see I was damaged and bad in my core. I wrote in a journal, I keep ruining everyone's time. That isn't something I would normally do. I'm not doing it on purpose. It's just, I keep doing it no matter how bad I don't want to. I don't want to swim or eat or play video games. I just can't have fun anymore. I feel like everywhere I go, I'm holding my breath. I don't like Disneyland anymore or Knott's Berry Farm. I don't like going out to eat or joining anything. I hate going outside in the front yard or any public places, even walking to the store. I even hate the beach. I hate everywhere except for the homes of people I know very well. One thing that drew me out of my room that year was my family went to the drive-in movies to see Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I was excited to see that movie because I could be cool at school by knowing some of the lines. I thought maybe I could impress Mark Paletti. There was tension between my parents on the drive over to the drive-in, but I ignored it. I just wanted to see cute Matthew Broderick and his crooked grin. We parked, and the next thing I knew, my dad was punching me with a closed fist. It was quick and swift and without warning, and he wouldn't let up. He was punching, punching, punching. The look on his face was terrifying, like a killer must look. I saw hate, disgust, anger. My mother sat there looking straight ahead. My sister was crying. My father finally gave me an idea as to why I was being hit. It seemed like he had just come up with it on the spot. It was for not eating what my mother cooked for dinner. Shit, it was technically true. I hated her vegetables. I had a gag reflex for canned French string beans, but... She hadn't cooked in ages, several months at least. I thought, wait a second. This can't be why he's punching me. He could not have that much anger at me for not eating some shitty string beans. Finally, my mom said, well, I don't exactly cook these days. And he stopped pounding me for a second. I thought, oh, thank God, my mother's coming to my defense. But then she said, even if I did cook, she wouldn't eat it anyway. He started punching me again as if I were a man. I tried to cover my face with the pillow I had brought from home. I thought, wow, this person has a very serious anger toward me. Both of them do. I had done something really, really wrong to make them not like me anymore. I felt like I was being blamed for something really big. I remember feeling so confused that my mother just sat there and did nothing while he beat me. I really hated both of them. When I look back, I think my mother might have been angry with my father for not sticking by her when she tried to discipline us and he was trying to make an effort at that time. My sister says, it just turned you inside out and you became the official family problem. I was your playmate every day though, and I remember you as a kid. And up until then, you were great. You were involved and creative and fun. You were always just cool and nice. And I don't see how all of a sudden you were the devil. All of a sudden I started seeing hostility when it never existed before. It was a little shocking. Back to me here. One day I was really sick in my room and I couldn't move out of bed and I needed my mom for something and she couldn't hear me because she was screaming in the living room at the top of her lungs singing Too Low for Zero by Elton John. I kept calling for her but she couldn't hear me. She was having a nervous breakdown. There was a definite problem in the family no one was talking about. It was just eating everybody. Nobody would do anything about it and it just festered right there in our house, right there in suburbia right there in a family that had gone to church and ate popsicles and had camping trips. I didn't think about my weight at all until one particular overcast day. 
My dad was in one of his unpredictable moods and I was lagging on getting laundry out of the dryer. He angrily told me to get off my fat ass and get the laundry. Then he smacked me in an angry, puppy-kicking way. I looked at his eyes and they were full of anger. Fat? He said, fat ass? Was I fat? Is that why they were mad at me? I wished I could just be a kid again. I was hurt by my dad's comment and immediately started to cry. Then I got angry, and I didn't know if I was mad about the fat thing or him smacking me. It wasn't some big fiasco where I was beat, beat to, to a pulp or anything. But regardless, I gathered myself up by my t-shirt, and I went up to him, and I looked him straight in the eyes, and I said in a thick, sobbing voice, If you ever touch me again, I'm calling the police. He backed off a little and looked at me, and we locked eyes. And my eyes said I meant business. He got the picture. I saw that click in his head that I wasn't just talking about being smacked on the butt for not getting the laundry. I was talking about him crossing a line with me. I was so scared I started to shake uncontrollably. I thought my legs would give out. I sat down in a dirty, faded brown director's chair on our patio and I started sobbing. He tried to console me and I snatched my arm away from him. I would love to say I felt much better after standing up to him and defending myself, but I really didn't. I felt very alone. I really just wanted to end my life. I wanted to die more than anything. I went in the bathroom, took out a bottle of Windex, and I thought, I should just drink this, then I would just be dead. But of course I couldn't bring myself to do it. I tried to find other ways to hurt myself instead, like carving in my skin with a knife or a pin. I cut into my arms. I cried and cried and cried. And when I felt that horrible, I would repeat to myself over and over, you are not really part of this family. You are completely separate from them. You're not even from here. You are here for future reasons that have nothing to do with today. Your reason for existence has nothing to do with this family or these times. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but that's the message I somehow got in the back of my brain. And I used it to comfort myself when I thought I couldn't go on. I remember not being clear on where I was supposed to be from, so I made up that I was from Jupiter so I could at least have a visual. But being from Jupiter was the least of my worries. When I look back on it, I sometimes think, was this just puberty? Was this just what normal teens did when going through puberty? Was I getting a lot of hormones, maybe? But then I realized it was a combination of that and something else. And I couldn't admit it or even think about it for years because it was so gross. My father had been behaving sexually toward me before all of the anger and terror started. That was the main problem, and it was too late to take it back. Then there was the secondary problem, the lack of protection from my mother. Why wasn't she there when I needed her? I wouldn't let my mind think about that either until several years later, when I told her about my suspicions in a long letter. The letter was five pages long, listing all of the things that I remembered about my dad's inappropriate behavior. I pictured her reading the letter. I thought she would first have a heart attack, then wake up and become hysterical. She would climb to the top of a mountain with a rifle in her hand and vow to kill the man who dared touch her child. I pictured her in a prairie dress, cocking a rifle, wiping back tears. I pictured her putting the rifle in my father's crotch with a fierce, unwavering look in her eye and telling him, nobody touches my child and gets away with it. Now you have me to deal with and pulling the trigger. But that's not what happened. What did happen was this. I received a letter in return containing exactly one paragraph. In the paragraph, she wrote that she believed me. Oh, okay, good. That's good, I thought. Then I read on. It said that she had suspected it. That took a minute to absorb. Wait, wait, wait. She suspected it? She was aware? What the fuck? I picked up the phone and called her, pressing her for more details. She admitted that once, before they had us kids, he looked at an, at an album cover of a shirtless child and said it was hot. Then she told me about another time when she caught him in the nude, while my sister and I were in the next room playing, and he purposely did not cover himself. There was another time when he called out one of our names during a romantic moment with her. There was the time that he watched a bunch of older boys have their way with a ten-year-old girl on his street. I didn't know how old he was when it happened. Was he the same age as the girl? Was he older? My mom then mentioned that there was a time that he bragged to his friends about having sex with a 12-year-old. Cue the sound of tires screeching to a halt. Wait, what? 
I was taken aback with the information my mother gave me. Who was that 12-year-old? Was it me? Did it happen when he was 12? When he was younger? Did my father still crave 12-year-olds? Is that why I woke up the day that I, the way that I did before my 12th birthday? Is that why I felt, why I felt danger around him? It was so disturbing, I, I just couldn't process it. But there was something that I could process. My mother thought something horrible could have happened to me, her child. And she never once asked me if I were in danger, if I needed help, or if I were okay. Not one peep. She would have taken it to the grave had I not brought it up myself. I sat down. I was furious and dizzy with rage. I just didn't know who I was more angry with, my perverted father, or the fact that my mother could have helped and didn't. And not only did she turn a blind eye to her child being in danger, but she purposely avoided me. How could she have turned on me? Why was I not worth helping, saving, rescuing? Was she told that I had some part in it? That it was my idea? I will never know. And she will never tell. So if that right there didn't drive me to become completely nuts, I really don't know what could have. Needless to say, I really hated both of my parents with fervor. But that was later, and at this point in my story, I really just hadn't put it all together in my head yet. So I felt confused, disgusted, scared, and angry. I didn't say much, and I came off as moody and pissed off at home and shy and isolated at school. And as much as I hated Middleton at first, I was beginning to prefer it to being at home. All right, let's get off this deep, dark subject because I'm getting depressed just writing it. So while that all sucked majorly, something even worse happened that June. Something that made me think the world was ending. Wham broke up. Yes, wham. I literally wept at the thought of losing two bronzed, highlighted ass shakers from my TV screen. How could they do that to me, to the world? It was probably more important to me at the time than my lame parents. In all seriousness, no. In all seriousness, though, I somehow trudged through the school year, making the best of my situation. I had fun with my friend Karen on the weekends, and I loved watching MTV, making up dances, and I still read a lot of books. I accepted I was not popular at school, and I was okay with it. I would never be one of the girls that the boys liked. But then one day, one sweet day, my luck changed. And let me start by saying that spending so much time in my room had allowed me to figure out how to do my hair. Aquanet sprayed into my bangs and the sides of my hair to make them stick out like puppy ears. It also gave me a lot of time to practice my 80s makeup, change some things around a little. Pale metallic pink lipstick and peach cream blush. I got some better fitting clothes and light pinks and light blues and I laid off the body spray. I got a little bit of a tan. I didn't look as much like a Dance Party USA cast off. And the next thing I knew, my crush, Mark Paletti, appeared to be interested in me. Me! I thought, no, this cannot be. I like a guy and he likes me back. This sort of thing does not happen to me. No way. One of the popular girls, Christy Schmidt, tried making conversation with me. She said, what do you think of Mark? I don't remember what I said, probably something safe, like, oh, he's nice. I thought I must have understood that she couldn't really be talking to me. Mark and I had lockers on the bottom row. His was only a few down from mine, and I remember getting my books out of my locker and smelling something like cinnamon. I sniffed harder. Was that aftershave I smelled? I looked over at Mark, and he appeared all shy suddenly. He was no longer acting like the class clown or the social guy cracking jokes like Mike Seaver. He looked at me and he said in a deepened voice, hi, not, not that lame actually. He, it dawned on me at that point, oh my gosh, this guy actually might like me. And my first thought was cool. And my second thought was shit, what do I do? I was mortified at the thought of dating him. What if he wanted to kiss me? I didn't know how to kiss. How would we see each other? I would have to tell my parents in order to go anywhere with him. I pictured myself in the backseat of our brown car, driving to his nice house over by the country club. My dad would act weird and embarrass me, and my mom would get awkward. Pfft, screw that! It would be so embarrassing, and I did not see any way it would work. 
I knew I would be too frightened to kiss him because I couldn't even talk to him without stuttering. I also decided it was too embarrassing to let my parents know I actually liked a boy in my class. I shut down out of fear and I decided to ignore him completely. And I was so glad summer vacation was only weeks away because I would not have to see him all summer and the whole thing would blow over by fall. So I tried waiting it out and I pretended that I didn't get the signals. And on the last day of school, Mark came up to me kind of defeated and he was like, see you next year in his forced man voice. He was looking me in the eyes. I wished I were not so chicken. I wished I would have gone for it. But I lost him, and I moved into the summer even more boy crazy. I daydreamed of him saying that line over and over and over. It was like fuel keeping me going, giving me something else to concentrate on besides my parents and the house of crazy. Live to Tell by Madonna was on MTV a lot around that time, and I listened to it as if it were the deepest thing I have ever heard, like it was written by the Dalai Lama or something, while fantasizing about making out with Mark. My sister Becky was two years younger than I and did not talk about boys, so I was often drifting off into my own world. It saddened me that boys were the only thing on my mind and were taken over my brain, but it really just was not controllable. I pictured doing it with Mark, but I just kind of really didn't know what that entailed. That summer, Karen and I watched either A, the roller derby, B, the big spin, which was that lottery show where they spin the thing, or see this movie called Desert Bloom with Annabeth Gish. We watched and rewatched that damn movie over and over, quoting the lines. I really think I memorized that entire script. We ate Doritos, we drank Diet Pepsi, and sometimes her dad got us value packs at McDonald's. I always got chicken McNuggets with barbecue sauce. She got a filet of fish we then spied on boys in her condo complex, all of whom were skaters. And at the time, skaters were guys who not only rode a skateboard, but they wore very specific t-shirts featuring different surfboard companies, such as Town and Country, Local Motion, and Maui and Sons. Skaters liked new wave or pop type of music at that time, and they were not into any sort of rock. They were more on the conservative side with short hair and long bangs over one eye. They were tan and fit and usually smoking hot. You never saw a fat skater. Karen and I perked up if we heard those skateboard wheels. We were such nerds though, we couldn't just say hi to boys. We would do something like throw rocks at them or start a fight with them somehow. We were really immature because we were deathly shy. She was even worse than I was. I wanted to see one guy in particular named Jim. He was drop-dead gorgeous with bright blue eyes and dark hair. He was so good looking it hurt. I thought my underwear would burst into flames. I remember watching a girl flirting with him and I was in awe of her for having the confidence to talk to him. Unlike me who hid and sounded like Igor living in a cave. In any case, I had a little boost of confidence from Mark Paletti in his aftershave. I ventured out of my room and even out of the house a little bit. I tried flirting with boys on my street. They didn't shoot me down. Got a few smiles, a little bit of romantic tension with one of the boys named Chad. And it was enough for me to feel happy. In between water balloon fights and crank calls, Karen, Becky, and I watched video after video on MTV. Karen and I fell in love with a group called Bananarama and their remake of Venus. It was the first tape I bought. My sister got into Bon Jovi and David Lee Roth, who just went solo from Van Halen. We lived for music. It was the backdrop of everything exciting we felt inside. All of the possibilities with boys, all of the butterflies.